Open your Bibles, please, with me tonight to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and while you're doing that, I'm going to read to you Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. Genesis 6, verse 4 says, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the, unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Last June, we had a bit of a debate in the church as to the meaning of the term sons of God in this passage, where it says the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them. As I said last June, there are two general positions on this topic, and there are I believe valid arguments from the Scriptures to be made on both sides. One view, which Brother Jade has dubbed the demigod theory, says that the sons of God in this passage are in fact angelic beings who abducted and made it in a physical union with human women and produced monstrous offspring known as the Nephilim or giants, a crossbred race of demigods as seen also in Greek mythology, 450 foot tall giants as the theory goes, or as the alleged book of Enoch actually presents it, for which the flood, the judgment of the flood came in Noah's day. The other view holds that the sons of God in this passage are actually the once godly line of Seth, who at one time, as we see in chapter 4 of Genesis, uh, both called upon and called themselves by the name of the Lord, but who later intermarried with the ungodly line of Cain, from whom uh, they once had separated and corrupted themselves thereby, going into idolatry, apostasy, and gross sin. And that it was the sin of man rather than the sin of angels or the commingling of angels and humans together that actually brought the judgment of the flood. As with many difficult topics of Bible doctrine that are debated among good Christians, uh, there are arguments to be made, I believe, on both sides of the issue, and there are also, I believe, good Christians who believe and live by the Scriptures that uh, disagree on this issue. In my view, the position that persistently seems to rely on very questionable non-biblical sources like the alleged book of Jasher, which I believe is actually not the original, but it's a fraud actually that was resurrected and published by the Mormons, or the alleged book of Enoch, which is also not the original, and is, in fact, not a reliable history book either. I do believe that those that rely on the book of Enoch to support the view that the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 are angels do so to their own shame and embarrassment. Uh, that position that relies on those sources is actually by far the weaker, I believe, of the two. And for what I see as very good biblical reasons, I choose to claim higher ground. I, I believe it's higher ground and take the position that I believe the sons of God in Genesis 6-4 are not angelic beings, are not angels. I'll come back to that shortly. First, I want to state that the correct and actual meaning of the term sons of God uh, in Genesis 6 has really no effect whatsoever on how I live my life as a Christian or how I serve my Savior. However, how we determine the meaning and the authority for our definition is all important to the Christian life and to our service of the Lord Jesus. But in my view, the meaning of Genesis 6-4 has been turned into a bit of a diversion and is really not worthy, I don't think, of devoting one's study and persistent attention on. I mean, so what if Tom Horn and Steve Quayle are right? Well, I mean, what if there is to be a last day's invasion of the Nephilim or of aliens? What if there is to be a zombie resurrection? as Tom Horn and Steve Quayle are now pushing their latest production, The Coming Zombie Apocalypse, by Steve Quayle and Tom Horn. What the Bible has to say about the impending war of the undead and what you can do to prepare for it. By the way, does Tom Horn sell zombie repellent on his website, on his survivalmall.com, fearmonger website? This stuff sells books and it sells survival gear, but it does not produce spiritual maturity that Josh was talking about earlier. I do not doubt 
that there is, in fact, a satanic agenda to create transhuman creatures. I have no doubt about that. Uh, but whether I believe that or not has no bearing on my security in Christ. I mean, I've been born again by the power and the Spirit of our God. He is in me as greater than He does in the world. And Jesus has promised not to lose me or forsake me. So I, have, I really don't need to fear these things. There is nothing that the devil can do through genetic manipulation or DNA mapping or transhuman engineering to change that fact. There's nothing he can do. Therefore, the, the meaning of the sons of God in Genesis 6 verse 4, who that in fact is, doesn't really affect my Christian life or how I serve my Savior. It's got nothing to do with what God's called me to do aside from possibly preaching on this subject. And it's certainly, by the way, not worth having a church split over on this subject. However, how I approach the Bible, how I determine what to believe about Genesis chapter 6, and what I hold out to be the authority for what I believe, is an all-important issue that affects all of life and everything that we believe about the Christian faith. And that is something that we as a church must agree upon. And so on that basis and for that reason, I decided to bring this message tonight on this topic. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. It says, Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not, that means argue not, about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. All heresy results from either adding to or subtracting from God's word. Paul says that we are to rightly divide the word of truth. And by the way, that word divide does mean to separate. It means to separate. But Paul's point in 2 Timothy 2.15 is not that we are supposed to cut the Bible up into pieces and parts like C.I. Schofield or like Thomas Jefferson did. Paul's point in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, is that we are to divide, we are to separate God's word from false teachings, from unprofitable words, and from vain and profane babblings. In verse 14, we are to divide or separate God's word from unprofitable words that subvert the hearers. In verse 16, we are to divide or to separate God's Word from profane and vain babblings that lead to ungodliness. Paul's point here is that we are to divide or to separate the Word of God from all other words and are to raise it up as our standard, as our sole authority. We are to adhere to God's Word alone as our sole source of spiritual truth and are to reject the teachings of mere men that are unprofitable diversions that can subvert the hearers. And that, in my view, includes the books of Jasher, Jubilees, and Enoch, which are not a part of the canon of Scripture, and I believe for a very good reason. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. A verse I've taken to heart and memorized. I love the verse. One of my favorite verses in the Bible says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. You know, we all want to know those secret things, don't we? We want to know those secret things. We're not quite satisfied with those things which are revealed. But by the way, that's why Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit. They wanted those secret things they weren't entitled to. There are many doctrines, many issues and doctrines that good Christians disagree about. There are many doctrines upon which there can be no debate, upon which the church must declare a position. And there are many fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith that are not up for debate and are clearly a matter of Christian fellowship. But there are also some debatable issues or doctrines that we can't agree to disagree on but without separating fellowship. And I think this is one of those issues as far as what we believe, the sons, who, who we believe the sons of God to be. But how we get there, we need to agree on. 
That said, while there are debatable doctrines, debatable issues in Scripture, uh, there is no area of Bible doctrine where two opposing views are both correct. Uh, biblical interpretation is never a matter of preference. 2 Peter 1 verse 20 says that there is no prophecy or interpretation of the Scripture of any private interpretation. God's truth is not subjective, in other words. It cannot be subjected to private interpretation. God's truth is objective and absolute. There is only one correct interpretation to the exclusion of all errant views to the contrary. And so the Bible says what it means, and it means what it says, and if we disagree about what it says, then one of us is wrong. So this issue, I believe, is a somewhat debatable doctrine, although I've come to more of a, a dogmatic position. But I certainly would say this is not an essential doctrine for our church to agree on as far as who the sons of God are. But this is an issue upon which we had better be faithful to God's Word as we approach it. Amen. So what about the book of Jasher? There are two scriptural references to the book of Jasher. Joshua 10, verse 13, and 2 Samuel 1, verse 17 to 18. And I would agree that because the book of Jasher is mentioned twice in the Bible, that the book would have a great deal of credibility if we had it in our possession today. I don't believe we do. In my view, the version is quoted and cited by many today as not credible and is, in fact, a forgery. Therefore, by the way, it's certainly not worthy of citing as an authority in our churches. There are several publications and editions that have been promoted as the genuine book of Jasher. Now, two of those are most popular. The shorter of those was allegedly discovered in the 800s A.D. during travels to the Middle East by a Flaccus Alcuinus of Britain, abbot of Canterbury. Now, the story claims that Alcuinus paid a large sum of gold uh, for permission to translate the Hebrew manuscript into English. Uh, which took Alcuin and his assistants 18 months to accomplish. The story goes that back in England then, Alcuinus uh, never made it public but passed it on to a friend and a fellow priest. It then became lost until it was rediscovered in the north of England in 1721 by some unnamed gentleman. Uh, this gentleman kept it private and took great care of the manuscript, giving it to a friend before he died. And so then this unnamed friend gave it to an editor, who also remained unnamed, and published it in Bristol, England, in 1829. It then seemed to disappear into obscurity again until the ancient mystical order of the Rosicrucis, the one universal Rosicrucian order, published the volume again in 1934. There are no known reputable scholars of the Bible or secular scholars of antiquities who have endorsed this 1829 Book of Jasher is genuine. Its main endorsement comes from the Rosicrucians. Outside such esoteric circles, it's generally regarded for good reason as fallacious and fictitious, fraudulent. Another much longer version, the more popular version of the Book of Jasher, has been, become popular and has had much greater circulation uh, since it first appeared on the scene in New York in 1840. The story of this version claims that the source was an ancient Hebrew text, manuscript, rescued from a Jewish scholar, allegedly in AD 70, the destruction of Jerusalem, by a Roman officer named Sidrus. The story says rather than killing the scholar, this, or the, yeah, this Jewish scholar, and destroying the library, which he should have done as a Roman, the Roman officer took the Jewish scholar and the books home to what is today in uh, Seville, Spain. Sometime later, allegedly, the manuscript was sent from Cordova, to be printed in Venice in 1625. There's no record of how many uh, copies were printed at that time or how widely they were circulated. But apparently, uh, no Bible scholars or any other scholar was interested in this Hebrew book, and no one thought to translate it into English or any other language, um, unlike, by the way, the Bible at that time, until a man named Moses Samuel of Liverpool, England, decided to translate it in the 1800s. So while working on this English translation, Samuel allegedly discovered the Rosicrucians had another version uh, that had been published in 1751 and had been widely exposed by scholars as a fraud. So due to the negative pub publicity of the other uh, version, Moses Samuel was discouraged from publishing his so-called genuine and scholarly version 
Uh, so instead, he sold the translation to Mordecai Noah, who was a New York publisher, who published the book in 1840, by the way, without acknowledging Mr. Samuel, under his own name. Then comes Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith's Latter-day Saints or Mormon Church. Very involved, of course, in claims of new scriptures and new revelations. Quickly adopted this version as authentic and reprinted the entire promotional write-up of the alleged book of Joshua from the, from the New York Star in its own early magazine called The Times and Seasons of June 1840. And then the printing rights of the 1840 New York version of the book of Jasher was obtained by a Mormon printing company called J.H. Perry and Company in Salt Lake City, Utah, which then published the document in 1887. While Christian scholars rejected the book early on, the Mormons, on the other hand, became fascinated with the book and have kept it in print and circulation uh, wherever they congregate. As one Mormon promoter of the book of Jasher, John P. Pratt, stated on the Internet, he said, The book of Jasher has been popular among members of the LDS Church ever since its publication was announced in the Times and Seasons in June of 1840. By the way, Pratt found a copy of his article online. He argues for Jasher's authenticity uh, based on its agreement with so-called modern-day revelation of Mormonism's latter-day false prophets. This is what this guy writes, this, this Mormon. says, The LDS people have something much better than the Dead Sea Scrolls for comparison of the book of Jasher. Let us instead compare the book of Jasher to modern revealed scriptures. Revelations of the Mormon so-called prophets, false prophets. There are many specific details mentioned in the book of Joshua which are not found in the Bible, but which are found in modern-day Revelation, especially in Doctrine and Covenants 1835 in the book of Moses, inspired translation of Genesis 1831, both of which were published before the book of Joshua became available to the prophet Joseph Smith in 1840. So he justifies the book of Joshua, so authenticity, because... It, might, it doesn't line up with the Bible, but it lines up with Mormon modern revelation. I would suggest this is not good reasoning for Jasher's authenticity. By the way, if this so-called book of Jasher agrees with modern Mormon revelation and disagrees with the Bible, I believe we should actually uh, avoid the book of Jasher like the plague. Since 1964, the book of Jasher has been reissued as a photo reprint of the 1887 edition and has been stocked in leading Mormon bookshops, etc. On the title page, it's declared to be the book of Joshua referred to in Joshua and 2 Samuel, faithfully translated from the original Hebrew into English. But neither this claim nor the contents of the book can be supported with any real evidence. The fact is that this book of Joshua actually contradicts the Bible in many, many places. I'm just going to give you a few of those. Number one, the book of Jasher claims that Sarai, Sarai was Abram's niece, where the Bible says she was his half-sister. In Genesis 20, verse 12, Abraham said, yet, And yet indeed she is my sister. She's the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. Jasher 16, verse 23 says, And Sarai, the daughter of Haran, Abram's wife. Haran was Abraham's brother, not his father. And so that's a contradiction there. Another contradiction, Joshua 13, verse 5, claims that Abram left Haran at the age of 50. But the Bible says Abram was uh, 75 years old, not 50. Genesis 12, verse 4, another contradiction. The, the book of Joshua, number 3, claims that after Jacob deceived Esau, rather than fleeing to his mother's brother, Laban, the book of Joshua says this, and Jacob was very much afraid of his brother Esau. He rose up and fled to the house of Eber, the son of Shem. He concealed himself there on account of his brother, and Jacob was 63 years old when he went forth from the land of Canaan from Hebron. And Jacob was concealed in Eber's house 14 years on account of his brother Esau. That obviously contradicts what the Bible says in Genesis 28, which says that Jacob went to the home of Laban, his mother's brother. It says, And Isaac sent away Jacob. He went away to Paddan Aram and to Laban son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. 
Another contradiction in Jasher 51 verse 37 says that, Josh, that Joseph's brother Simeon could not be bound. It says, And Joseph went out from them and came into the chamber and wept a great weeping, and his pity was excited for them. And he washed his face and returned to them again. And he took Simeon from them and ordered, them, ordered him to be bound. But Simeon was not willing to be done so, for he was a very powerful man, and they could not bind him. That's what Jasher says. The Bible says this, in Genesis 42, verse 24. He turned himself away, Joseph, from them and wept. And he returned to them again and talked with them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Several contradictions like this occur in the book of Jasher. Jasher lists 15 plagues on Egypt rather than 10. Chapter 17 of Jasher states that Moses was 18 years old when he left Egypt. Uh, he says he didn't go to Midian, as the Bible says, but he went to Cush, where he became actually king over Cush for 40 years. And then Jasher says he went to Midian, where Ruel puts him in prison for 10 years because he thought that he was wanted by the Cushites, contradicting what the Bible says about Moses going directly to Midian. Also, the book of Jasher, chapter 81, verse 38, says the waters of the Red Sea were divided into 12 parts. Of course, the Bible says it was divided into two. The point here is that the book of Jasher is not the inspired word of God. It's not included in the canon of Scripture for good reason. It's not a reliable source of either spiritual or historical truth. So I've come to that same conclusion about the book of Enoch as well. I have the same opinion of what we call the book of Enoch as I do the book of Jasher. Uh, after I got saved, shortly after, thereafter, about a year after, I decided to do as my grandparents had done and read through the Bible uh, once a year, every year. And after about four or five years of doing that, I decided to read the Apocrypha. I got kind of interested in it, but as I read through there, I noticed, you know, this is not the same author. It's just not the same author. And you, you can tell as you're reading through it. I mean, when you read through the Bible, you know, cover to cover, this is written by God, by the Spirit of God. But when you read another text, God didn't write this. I mean, if, you're, if you've got the Holy Spirit within you, you know, God, God didn't write this. And it's that way with the book of Enoch as with the book of Jasher. Personally, I do not believe that uh, the same Enoch that Jude quotes from who lived before the flood of Noah in the seventh generation from Adam, who walked with God and who God took because he walked with God. I don't believe that Enoch wrote this transcript or this manuscript that we today call the book of Enoch. As with many parts of the, the Apocrypha and with the book of Jasher, the book of Enoch in many places directly contradicts the Bible and, and, the, and actually in some places teaches downright heresy. I'm going to give you an example. Chapter 40 of the book of Enoch. It's kind of a long quote. This writer, whoever it is, says this. After that, I saw thousands of thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. I saw a multitude beyond number and reckoning who stood before the Lord of Spirits, which he calls God the Lord of Spirits throughout this passage. On the four sides of the Lord of the Spirits, I saw four presences. Four presences, different from those that sleep not. For the angel that went with me made known to me their names and showed me all the hidden things. And I heard the voices of those four presences as they uttered praises before the Lord of glory. The first voice, blessed the Lord of spirits forever and ever. And the second voice I heard blessing, the elect one and the elect ones who hang upon the Lord of spirits. And the third voice I heard pray and intercede for those who dwell on the earth and supplicate in the name of the Lord of spirits. And I heard the fourth voice fending off the Satans and forbidding them to come before the Lord of spirits to accuse them who dwell on the earth. After that, I asked the angel of peace who went with me, who showed me everything that is hidden. Who are these four presences which I have seen and whose words I have heard and written down? He said to me, this first is Michael, the merciful and long-suffering. And the second, who is set over all the diseases and all the wounds of the children of men, is Raphael. And the third, who is set over all the powers, is Gabriel. And the fourth, who is set over the repentance unto hope of those who inherit eternal life, is named Phanuel. And these are the four spirits of the Lord of the Spirits. And the four voices I heard in those days. The Bible, by the way, never mentions an angel named Phanuel, let alone an angel who is set over the repentance of those who inherit eternal life. This statement in itself, I believe, is completely unbiblical. Jesus said there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. Uh, when a sinner repents, I don't believe that the angels of heaven you know, come up and pat Phanuel on the back, you know, give him the credit because he led this guy to repentance. The Lord Jesus said that the Holy Spirit 
is He who convicts men of sin. It's a conviction of the Holy Spirit of God Himself that brings men to repentance, not the work of some angel named Phanuel. When I got saved, I was born of God, not born of Phanuel. Just as repentance is not the work of an angel named Phanuel, neither is the book of Enoch the work of the same Enoch that Jude quoted from. Enoch that walked with God and it was not because God took him. There are many other examples in Enoch of outright heresies and ridiculous folklore. Yes, the book of Enoch does implicitly support the Nephilim theory. According to the alleged book of Enoch, God judged the angels, producing the Nephilim, which are alleged in the, this book of fiction to have been 300 cubits tall. In Enoch 7, it says, Whose stature was each 300 cubits. These devoured all which the labor of men produced until it became impossible to feed them. When they turned themselves against men in order to devour them, they began to injure birds, beasts, reptiles, and fishes to eat their flesh one after another to drink their blood. Then the earth reproved the unrighteous. 350 foot tall were these Nephilim. Excuse me, 300 cubits. That's 450 feet tall. As tall, by the way, as a 45 story building. Also, the book, the alleged book of Enoch, alleges that God uh, allegedly decreed that the fallen angels were to be cast into Tartarus. The Nephilim were also judged, and it was determined that their bodies were to return to the earth in peace, but their souls were doomed to wander the earth forever as wandering spirits. That's what the book of Enoch says. In addition to the wild fantasy accounts of such creatures, I have a few more words to say tonight about obvious heresies in this book, uh, this alleged book of Enoch. I've got a couple other examples tonight. There are many we could point to, many problems with the book of Enoch. It's just all over the place. It's a hodgepodge of stories. It's not at all uh, organized the way the Bible is. But a couple of other examples of heresies and contradictions in the book of Enoch that need to be pointed out. We read in chapter 69 about a fallen angel named Gadriel, of whom it says, He it is who showed the children of men all the blows of death. And he led astray Eve, Enoch says, and showed the weapons of death to the sons of men. Now this is an obvious contradiction of the Bible, which says that Satan was he, Satan himself was the one who led Eve astray. Revelation 12 says that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Eve included, by the way. I also want to mention that the Bible does not mention a book of Enoch. It does mention the book of Jasher. Nowhere does the Bible mention a book of Enoch. Jude quotes from Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam, but he does not say that Enoch wrote a book. In fact, according to the alleged book of Enoch, for Enoch to have written a book would have been an egregious sin. We read in the book of Enoch, chapter 69, verse 8, about another evil fallen angel. And the fourth was named Penemui, or Penemu, I don't know how you pronounce that. He taught the children of men the bitter and the sweet, and he taught them all the secrets of their wisdom. And he instructed mankind in writing with ink and paper, and thereby many sinned from eternity to eternity and until this day. For men were not created for such a purpose, to give confirmation to their good faith with pen and ink. It's an egregious sin to write, to write these things in the book. It goes on and on. But this is utter foolishness and nonsense. It should be clear, I think, to everyone here, this is absolute ludicrous hogwash. Peter says in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20, knowing this first, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture, Peter's talking about a book written in black and white, pen and ink. No prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This ridiculous passage in the alleged book of Enoch would have made it a sin for every one of those holy men to have recorded and written down the word of God. Also would have made it an egregious sin for Enoch to have done so. Kind of outlaws the very book of Enoch that is, that is contained within, if that's possible. Of all the things in my life I'm thankful for, I would say, have to say, that the thing for which I am most thankful that has changed my life more than anything else has or could, has been the written, recorded Word of God. I am so glad that God wrote His Word down for me in black and white, and that we have this standard that we can raise up when the enemy comes in like a flood. We've got this standard of truth to raise up against the enemy. The book of Enoch, on the other hand, 
as a jasher, was written to attack the written word of God and make it appear to be a bunch of fairy tales and folklore. So I want to repeat that anyone who relies upon the alleged book of Enoch, which is a book of fantasy, fiction, fabrication, and heresy, does so to his own shame and embarrassment. This message is continued on part two. What does the Bible say? Sons of God versus fallen angels. We would urge you to listen to the entire two-part message.